Hello, and thank you for joining the Pituitary Network Association's webinar program, which is brought to you through the support of our sponsors and our expert contributors. The PNA is dedicated to educating people with pituitary disorders, their families, and their healthcare providers. The PNA is a nonprofit organization that relies on the support from our members and donors. During the webinar, feel free to type in your questions at any time. Please note that all questions will be saved until the end of the webinar. We have a lot of time to answer as many questions as possible. Today's webinar, a large single institutional comparison of microscopic and endoscopic pituitary surgery, lessons learned, is presented by Dr. Jamie Van Gumpel. Dr. Van Gumpel is a professor in neurosurgery and otorhinolaryngology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Please hold while there's a brief delay while we change presenters. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Is that okay? There we go. Yep, we hear you. Good. And can you see me? Now we can see you. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Well, Danielle and PNA, thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, today. I'm going to present, um, if I can get my screen to come up with the presenter on the side. Um, a talk called The Large Single Institutional Comparison of micro, uh, Microscopic and uh, Endoscopic Pituitary Surgery Lessons Learned uh, from Our Institution. Um, by way of disclosures, um, none of these are pertinent to this talk, but I do receive funding for some NIH awards as well as I have stock and company ownership and Neural One and Cadence companies that we founded related to brain machine interface work, but again, not related to pituitary um, disease or pituitary tumors today. Um, what I want to cover today uh, is um, I think what's really important and it's uh, kind of gone back over my 10-year career so far at uh, Mayo Clinic and that I think there's a lot of misunderstanding of what microscopic and endoscopic surgery truly are and I think there's a lot of hybrid out there and I want um, you know at least looking at our institution in which I believe we have people practicing both microscopic and endoscopic surgery in its purest form does, does there appear to be any uh, real approach related uh, differences between them? And I think that's gonna be critical. So we're gonna spend the first 15 minutes of this talk um, really concentrating on a better understanding of uh, that particular um, disease, you know, that particular issue, uh, the uh, types of surgery that we can do. And then, uh, and then from there on, I go on over a study. So this is where this started about 10 years ago. Uh, this is me on a YouTube video that I'm gonna bring up here. That was my attempt back then to explain it, and I do think if we can get it to launch. Sorry, it's going to take a second here. Here it comes. We'll watch this and see what uh, see what we said back then, and I think it's a good starting point to kind of go over again. Hello, what... my name is Shannon Van Gumpel. Sorry. The webinar is creating a little bit of issue here with it. Let me see if I can. I'm a neurosurgeon at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I have a particular passion for performing skull-based surgery and delivering this in a maximally effective way with minimal repercussions in a minimally invasive way. Skull-based surgery involves complex surgery at the interface of the facial bones and the bones of the skull. Some tumors we treat occur around the pituitary gland at the back of the nose. These include craniopharyngiomas, pituitary tumors, chordomas, chondrosarcomas, meningiomas. In the past, operative microscopes were utilized um, to remove these tumors as these were the only way to magnify that space. 
Unfortunately, with operative microscopes, the light and the visualization occur outside the head. Therefore, larger openings were needed, uh, either in the head or through the nose, to perform this surgery safely. In the past 15 years, technological advances have occurred through mostly other fields with the introduction of endoscopes, which have revolutionized the way that care is delivered in surgical fields. And skull bay surgery is no exception. Endoscopes offer the ability to bring light and surgical viewing to the tumor itself, thereby minimizing the exposure through the skull or nose, thereby potentiating improved removal, improved safety, and improved patient outcomes. This prop mimics the difference between a microscopic pituitary surgery as well as an endoscopic pituitary surgery. The camera would uh, mimic the microscope. With the microscope, you're limited in light that gets to the visual field of what you're actually working. Here, this cover demonstrates what it's like to look through the cranium or the nose. You can, you can see that if I advance this, by maneuvering the camera or the object, you can see bits and pieces of the object of interest in the deep field. However, an endoscope is like bringing the camera to the actual field. Here, mimic by taking the cover off. You're actually able to see the object of interest more clearly. This allows you to be more oriented, to improve your safety in terms of a more complete resection, uh, and see critical structures more clearly. Skull-based tumors pose significant challenges due to their close proximity to important nerves and vessels. Surgical resection can be associated with So, and just kind of, you know, our, our learning and uh, understanding of these have developed over time. And what I really wanted to uh, point out here again is um, we're going to talk later about, you know, how microscopic, microscopic and endoscopic surgery at least compare at our institution. And I want to um, introduce my colleague, Dr. John Atkinson here. He's pictured in the side here, who has performed for over 25 years microscopic pituitary surgery and taught me how to do pituitary surgery. And um, what's important is, so this is an operative microscope over to the uh, screen on the right here. And what we see is the eye or your, or your vision, as well as the light is, is generated outside of the field that we're working. So the smiley face here is representing the tumor. We have to put a speculum through the nose where that light is shined through, land on it, and work through that. So the speculum is placed in those and it confines the instruments that opening. Therefore, oftentimes the tumor has to be brought to the central portion of the field and we have to move the microscope around to see different areas within the field. There's two different types of techniques for this. There used to be a lot of transeptal techniques uh, that uh, used to occur in which people used to make an uh, incision in the lip. And then they would expose the whole cella, which was quite an expansive opening, but resulted in lip numbness. And now more commonly, people perform a transnasal procedure in which the speculum is placed in one side of the, of the nose. And you can see a lot of the uh, pituitary gland still, but not as well as it used to be able to, but it gets the job done. This is a, another classic pituitary surgery performed by my colleague, Dr. Atkinson. And uh, what you see here is bone that's been removed. These metal objects out here is the actual um, speculum. And you can see how Dr. Atkinson, who's gifted at this, can move the scope around and see things back there very well. Ultimately, as you can see here, the instruments come through where you're working. So you kind of have to, sometimes your fingers get in the way or, or, or whatever. Um, but ultimately you're able to see what you need to get done. And what you'll see here is this is a very soft tumor. So he's gonna bring some tumor into the field. He's gonna kind of pull it to where he's working. He'll take some biopsies of this tumor as we always do. Um, but I think it's always interesting that uh, patients find it uh, um, surprising that these tumors are so soft and most commonly we end up sucking them away or, or curataging them away. And this is a very classic tumor that we see here and probably over 50% of the tumors are like this. And then ultimately, Dr. Atkinson is going to look through his, uh, spec, his speculum and through his, his uh, um, curette and take a look around. So that's the gland that's descended. He's going to feel around as best he can and bring tumor back to that central area with this. And what it results in is a very small opening, which uh, heals very well and is easy to treat if there's a CSF leak. 
So the advantages of this technique is it's very quick. Um, it's tried and true. It only needs one surgeon to perform the technique as most people can uh, get in there and out without a, a, the help of an ENT surgeon, although Dr. Atkinson and our teams use an ENT surgeon because it's helpful for the patient. And uh, the disadvantages, however, is very limited to the pituitary gland. Oftentimes the instruments are in the way of your vision and obviously light comes from outside the nose. As opposed to what I perform, doctor, or, um, endoscopic pituitary surgery. So this is performed with an endoscope and a tower. There's these uh, high resolution screens in the room. This is the camera going into this patient's nose. And this sends cables up to here that we can put up to multiple booms during the operation. And we utilize this and now in what is 4K, but when we started this, it was just HD. And so the endoscope is brought into the, into the field. So through the nose, so before we were saying that speculum was, where the eye and the light are there and it, it allows us to see a more expansive view and uh, see it in a brighter way. Um, it has more, you're, more, you're able to have more exposure than microsurgery because you can. And the belief uh, is that if, because we can see more, we may leave lefts behind because uh, we're able to actually inspect it, but that's been not proven necessarily with data. I'm gonna switch over to some uh, short videos here to kind of explain this. Sorry, this thing's trying to load. But this is a pituitary surgery with an endoscope and a 4K tower. And what we see now is you see the camera dynamically moving the field. Before we could more or less see where the pituitary was exposed, but now we can see where the carotid arteries would be below this bone um, on both sides. The optic nerves are actually sitting up here and accessible. And we're able to do just like with the microscope, true microsurgery with this. And here we are opening the dura in a um, delicate way. This is the pituitary tumor behind this. I'll speed it up a little bit just so we don't spend too much time doing this. Um, and what we see here now is the ability to do microdissection. So this is that dura, but this little red, um, reddish outline here is actually the edge of the pituitary gland. And we're going to slowly dissect down what it turns out to be a firmer tumor. Um, the pituitary gland away from this. And as we do that, this tumor is going to drop into our field. And you can see here how nice we can move those instruments around rather than bringing the, the um, uh, tumor and breaking it up and bringing it to the center of the field. And right here, we're going to continue to make that nice plane and take advantage of this, this uh, tumor's firmness to take and break those connections to it. The tumor is quite large, so we are going to debulk it a little bit. And here, we're going to work and get behind it with a, cure, with a curette like we did in the last case where Dr. Atkinson did. And we're going to take that capsule down and take this tumor out in its entirety. And then at the end, we're going to be able to see little pieces that we're going to take out. And we'll inspect this in the end with, uh, with our endoscope, as you'll see. This is the pituitary gland so nicely here. We're able to bring that scope into the field so it magnifies it when we bring it in. And it works quite well. There are some other things that one can do with the with an endoscope that you cannot necessarily that you can do in some circumstances. But for instance, this is the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus that we're going to remove in a patient with Cushing's disease. You can see it's infiltrated with tumor right here, and this is quite hard to do without with uh, with a unilateral technique. We'll go back to our presentation now. So the advantage in this particular situation is that you have a wider field of view and we believe that it provides better visualization. Uh, we're able to address pathologies outside the uh, pituitary gland or uh, when the pituitary tumors extend into the clivus or into the recesses around there or out towards the carotid arteries. Um, I put better nasal outcomes in question uh, because we don't think that this is the direct result of doing endoscopic pituitary surgery, but we do know that as you see down here, not sure that sometimes we need more sinus surgeries to make the nose more normal to be able to work through. And there is a couple of studies that would support that that would provide better nasal outcomes after this and not necessarily related to the technique itself. The disadvantages that have been shown in other studies, it's slower, it's more costly to the institution. There's a lot more pieces and things that need to be taken up. 
There's a bigger exposure in the nose, although you don't see that outwardly. Therefore, there's a higher chance for, for having more difficult to treat CSF leagues. And it is true that patients need more post-op nasal care, which also might contribute to more better nasal outcomes in these particular circumstances. But it is common for patients to get debridements because additional sinus surgery is being done to get back to this area. So this is a summary slide, and I guess the question ultimately is, what's the is the is the juice worth the squeeze, or is the cost worth the value between these two? And we'll go over some of that, some of those thoughts. This is just side by side comparison of a similar tumor, the one you saw in the video, to the similar tumor that uh, the Dr. Atkinson removed for this type for our um, for our paper that we're going to discuss. But you can see that speculum. This is a view of the sphenoid. This is a similar view of the sphenoid with an endoscopic view. Um, and you can see with this, it's a similar size curette right here. And this is what it looks like when it's amplified and out. But they're just <clears throat> different techniques. And one is really aimed at, uh, at better visualization. The other one is aimed at, uh, at, less, um, at less exposure, less opening. Uh, but I think people have pretty good outcomes for years with that particular technique. And endoscopes are, are a newer technique. And that's never more evident than this recent paper that was just published in Journal, Journal of Neurosurgery in 2021, in which if you look at the period of time from 2010 to 2016, there was a 66% increase in the use of endoscopic surgery during that time, and a 40% decline in the use of microscopic surgery. So for whatever reason, this is uh, the endoscopic surgery is either more is easier to learn maybe, um, or maybe people believe that it has some more advantage, marketing advantage or whatever have you. But across the country, it is now true that more people perform endoscopic surgery than microscopic surgery, but both are still being performed. Um, and the literature supports for uh, microscopic surgery that it's cheaper, it's faster. And for endoscopic surgery, again, that there may be better, better nasal outcomes. Um, for tumors that are greater, that are that are larger tumors, greater than 2.5 centimeters, there's an increased extent of resection in, those, in that particular group. The complications is a little bit tricky, uh, as there for a period of time was a referral bias for more difficult tumors. At least that's been well described in the literature towards uh, endoscopic techniques. Um, and then, uh, and in those larger studies, therefore. There is a possible increase in carotid artery injuries in endoscopic surgery. However, none of the head-to-head -head comparison studies have supported that, uh, but that is present in the metadata that's out there. And there's possibly worse pituitary function outcomes with um, uh, microscopic surgery, which was seen in the transfer study for um, non-functioning adenomas. If you want to look into extent of resection, we've uh, just our last uh, two, two um, or three uh, PNA talks ago, myself and my partner, Dr. Choby, went over this, and uh, you can uh, view this. It's a, it's a study about that. We're not going to make this uh, talk today about extent of resection, but you can look to that study for that. Today, we're going to cover uh, pituitary tumor surgery, a comparison of endoscopic and microscopic techniques, a single center study. And, um, this is the culmination of work through a lot of authors and worker and, uh, and surgeons at our institution, both myself and Dr. Atkinson, which we'll describe later, as well as our uh, uh, excellent and, uh, and, and collaborative um, uh, work with our ENT colleagues, our colleagues in neuroradiology, anesthesiology, and endocrine, uh, which it really takes a team to do this type of work. And, and honestly, every we couldn't do this without any any one of those groups. <clears throat> but in this particular study, it's a six-year epoch of its retrospective study that occurred from January 1st, 2014 to um, December 31st, 2019. All surgeries in this research were performed by one of two surgeons uh, who operate on similar op in similar operating rooms. In fact, my uh, OR is right next to Dr. Atkinson's OR, and we operate on the same operative day most days. That doesn't mean we're both there the same day every day. Um, so Dr. Atkinson has been performing microscopic transnasal surgery exclusively for 20 to 26 years during this study, <clears throat> and his approach is, has a philosophy of Zane at a minimally invasive, quick, effective approach relying on uh, curatage and effective surgery, and he's very good at it and taught me pituitary surgery. Um, Myself uh, performed endoscopic surgery exclusively during this time period and have not converted one case over to microscopic. And this was from three to nine years post-residency experience uh, during the years of the study. And now, I, uh, granted, I did spend um, time in a fellowship learning this type of a technique, but um, 
anyway, uh, earlier in my career than Dr. Atkinson, and my uh, technique is aimed at complete visualization of tumor, direct visualiz visualized resection, and advanced skull-based techniques to enhance resection at the expense of time and needing maximum exposure. The referral population was a true referral population in that uh, of 534 patients included in the study, the average distance is uh, um, a linear distance is traveled by Google. Uh, was 503 miles for patients uh, in our uh, overall cohort. For the microscopic set, it was 501 miles. And for the endoscopic subset, it was 505 miles. 30 of those patients traveled less than 60 miles away uh, uh, to the Mayo Clinic for surgery. 176 of those patients traveled between 61 and 200 miles. And 328 of those patients traveled a quite a distance, over 200 miles for surgery with us. Um, during that period of time, there was 855 surgeries that were uh, uh, performed through the nose. Uh, my um, uh, uh, 534 of those were for pituitary surgery. Uh, for the microscopic technique, 311 uh, cases were performed by Dr. Atkinson. Of those, 273 were for pituitary adenomas. And for myself, 544 transnasal cases occurred, and 261 of those, so less than 50%, are for pituitary adenomas. And I, I suppose, um, you know, things like Rathke's cleft cysts and for me, chordomas, craniopharyngiomas, and things like that are also done through the nose. And when we look at the breakdown of our tumors, approximately 53% of the tumors are functioning, meaning that they make a hormone that is active somewhere else on the body. Um, the most common type is an ACTH secreting tumor, which was similar between the microscopic and endoscopic cohorts. The non-functioning tumors were slightly higher within the uh, microscopic co cohort, which means they're not secreting something that is affecting the rest of the body. Um, but this difference was not sp uh, statistically significant. And overall, a very similar uh, data set between the two. When we look at both groups, so in this, these next couple tables will look very similar in which we have a combined patient cohort of 534 patients compared to the microscopic cohort of 273 patients, and then the endoscopic group of patients that I treated with 261, what we see is that their age is very similar across the study. When we look at the mean tumor size, it's two or 2.1 centimeters and very similar. Whether or not they had prior surgery was more common for patients to have prior surgery within the endoscopic group. And it should be noted that we did not exclude any patients from this ana uh, analysis um, as uh, we do both uh, um, perform uh, uh, referral population surgery. So a lot of these patients have been previously operated on. I think that's important to note, but it was higher in the endoscopic group. The mean follow-up was similar between the two groups. And our first significant finding, which has been supported previously in the literature, is when we look at the OR time, um, the microscopic surgeries took on average an hour and a half uh, from uh, opening to closure, where the um, endoscopic procedures took about two hours to perform. The other thing that was quite significantly different is the need for additional uh, surgery or different surgeries or radiation. In the microscopic uh, cohort, there was, a, there was a lot more than the group of the endoscopic surgery, see, meaning that patients that underwent microscopic surgery either went on to radiation or additional surgery more frequently. Um, not many of those patients were staged resection, which happens in microscopic surgery. There was three within that group, um, but uh, there were a, a, a fair number of additional treatments in that group. The length of stay in the hospital was on average 1.3 days, and we'll go over how that compares to other places uh, shortly at the end of this talk. When we looked at other things like post-operative infections, they were quite low overall, 0.8% uh, in the microscopic group and 0% uh, in the endoscopic group. Cases stopping for, stopped for bleeding. There were two cases in the um, uh, microscopic group and none in the endoscopic group. Two cases of visual worsening only uh, in the whole cohort. Again, none in the endoscopic group. There was one death um, in an older patient that had a, uh, um, a lumbar drain and ultimately had over drainage in the microscopic group. There were none in the endoscopic group. When we looked at this as notable events um, compared, you know, microscopic and endoscopic group, these larger complications were more common in the microscopic group, but uh, any individual complication was not more frequently seen um, uh, in, the, uh, in any one of the groups.
CSF leak rates were very low at 2% overall, with six in the microscopic group and five in the endoscopic group. And most remarkably, the 30-day readmission rate was very low. Um, one might wonder if this was because patients traveled such a distance. We keep uh, close phone contact with our patients and not believe that this is an artifact. When we look at the overall groups, um, there was a preponderance for higher NOSP Steiner grading. So these are differences between uh, higher grades of cavernous sinus invasion, which would correlate with more difficult to remove tumors. They were higher in the endoscopic group as compared to the microscopic group, and microscopic group typically had less cavernous sinus invasion. Um, but we were unable to assess this in a multivariate na analysis. When we compared the data for the ACTH, or tumors that are causing Cushing's disease, so this is functionally active, not silent, ACTH secreting tumor uh, patients, what we found was there was really no difference in age, uh, the percentage of females enrolling, um, the uh, number of patients with MR negativity, although this wasn't statistically significant, there was a fair number more in the microscopic case. Uh, cases. Again, the prior surgical cases were, were, were higher, but not statistically significantly so in the endoscopic procedures. And in these patients, the post-op remission rates were around 70%, which is pretty good considering the number of patients with MR negative uh, disease. Uh, and the uh, post-op remission rates look very good, but not statistically significant between groups. And interestingly, the rates of CSF were, leak were quite low for a Cushing's disease patients and pituitary dysfunction, especially considering some of these patients underwent subtotal gland resection, uh, was present um, in about 6% of patients overall, higher in the endoscopic group at 9%. We compared uh, uh, growth hormone secreting tumors, so tumors that are causing acromegaly in, in some circumstances or giganticism in younger patients. We had 45 in the microscopic group and 38 in the endoscopic group. What we saw was a statistically significant difference in prior surgery in the endoscopic group, meaning that uh, more patients underwent prior surgery. There was no difference in the percentage of females, mean age, mean tumor size between groups, and ultimately the mean follow-up. The uh, post-operative remission rates uh, were 64% um, in the endoscopic group, 46% in the microscopic group, and 53% overall, which correlates again with these larger tumor sizes that we're seeing. CSF leak rates were quite uncommon, um, and pituitary dysfunction in this group was uncommon as well. Now, the most important group probably to look at is the non-functioning tumors or the uh, non-functioning adenomas. Again, between the microscopic and endoscopic groups, there was pretty similar overall date or uh, age range. The female percentages were a little bit higher in the microscopic group, but not statistically significant. There was a higher percentage of patients with larger tumors in the endoscopic group by about four millimeters only. And the prior surgeries was very similar. Mean follow-up was very similar as well. As has been previously shown, when we did a formal volumetric analysis, and we'll cover this later uh, in this talk, um, there was an increased percentage of resection in the endoscopic groups, and we only considered tumors greater than 2.5 centimeters. If we, if we considered all tumors, the resection rates were up in the upper 90s percent. Um, Reoperation within the study for this was, was, uh, was a lot less common with microscopic, but it was not statistically significant. And again, this is uh, just showing that there is a, a concept in um, uh, microscopic surgery of doing a resection, letting the tumor mass fall, and doing a second resection, which was, uh, this is to show that it wasn't commonly employed in this particular group of patients. Radiation administered postoperatively was much different between the groups. There was 12 patients in the endoscopic cohort and 34 in the microscopic cohort. Quite a large difference in patients that ultimately went on to postoperative radiation, which probably correlates uh, well with the overall resection of these, of these um, uh, particular patients. Post-op CSF leak rates were low, 30-day readmission rates were low at 4% and very similar. New anterior pituitary dysfunction post-operatively in these larger tumors was around 10%, and new permanent um, DI was uh, in the range of about 3 to 4%. Um, I think there's a couple of very important uh, findings in this study in that the length of, ho of hospital stay averaged about 1.3 uh, days over the course of the study. Overall, 82% of patients were dismissed on postoperative day one, and that's 78% in the MS group, the microscopic group, and 85% in the endoscopic group. 
And uh, hospital readmission rates within 30 days occurred in 18 patients in the overall study at 3.4%, which is very low. Again, going to the, the tumors greater than 2.5 centimeters, which we covered in the prior slide, there was a significant least a, a difference in be, between the volumetric resection between endoscopic and microscopic as previously stated. So what we found also would look at our institutional costs for these patients is that MS had a lower cost per surgery by approximately 16% as direct charges to the hospital. And it was certainly a short, shorter operation as was predicted um, uh, before the study. Um, with uh, endoscopic surgery, there are fewer repeat surgeries or need for radiation after, um, which should enter the cost uh, discussion. However, it's, it's hard to know what the actual costs of those were across the study. So we think that there's increased costs. We don't know if it offsets the 16% change. Um, so 79% of patients in the MS group needed additional treatment and 56 uh, uh, patients in the, in the endoscopic group needed additional treatment. So how does this compare to a, a recently released in 2020 large institution or large multi-institutional study uh, looking at just non-functioning adenomas uh, done by multiple endoscopic and microscopic surgeons? And I think this study uh, kind of highlights the role of um, what a nat multiple institution study can do and why there's still a role for singular institutional studies. When we look at this, uh, when we look at our study that we're presenting today compared to that national study, the number of patients enrolled in our study with non-functioning adenomas were 253. The number in the transfer study was 260. Our mean age was exactly the same. The percentage of females was exactly the same. The mean tumor size was exactly the same. The prior uh, surgery were a little bit higher, but not statistically so. In the transfer study, they followed their patients uh, by three months to, uh, total. And then after that, they didn't get long-term follow-up in the study. We had longer-term follow-up. When we look at the two uh, comparisons, though, we see the CSF leak rate being much lower in this study at 2.8%, the 30-day readmission rate being at 4%, and the new anterior pituitary dysfunction being um, uh, not quite half of what the rate was in the transfer study, but at 9.5%, uh, and new permanent DI being quite similar to the transverse uh, study. When we look at other key metrics within the study, the length of stay in the transfer study was on average 3.2 days, uh, and in this study, 1.3 days, so cutting the, the admission stay uh, yeah, by one third. The 30-day readmission rate, which we talked about previously at 4% and 6.5%. But the real interesting part was the length of the operation as reported, which is defined as from the start of the operation, not into the room, to the end of it, in our study, you know, there was the um, MS cases were 48 minutes shorter than the endoscopic cases. In the transfer study, there was a larger difference of 74 minutes. But when you compare these two groups, the microscopic surgeries in the transfer study took on average 219 minutes. Um, Dr. Atkinson surgeries take on average 83 minutes. My surgeries on average take 130, 31 minutes. Looking at the endoscopic group, uh, it, within the transfer study, they were on average 293 minutes. So what's remarkable about this data set is that it's um, the overall operation is much shorter than this. So it's obviously very surgeon dependent. Um, and I think that's the take home point. We don't have any reason to believe that a shorter surgery um, is better by any means or a longer surgery is better. We just believe that ultimately shorter surgeries result in less complications. So here's what we learned from this study. So despite different techniques used for pituitary adenomas, no matter where the study is done, uh, the overall surgical risks are really quite low. And I think that should make everybody watching the study, this uh, talk tonight quite happy. In our study, there was no carotid artery injuries. The overall risk of postoperative infection was 0.4%. The risk of a postoperative CSF leak requiring treatment was 2%. Readmission for any reason within 30 days is uh, occurred in 3.4% of patients. And if you look at that, most commonly that's for uh, post-operative CSF leak. The other re reason was for post-operative hyponatremia. So therefore an active endocrine group helps prevent readmissions. The new anterior pituitary dysfunction was seen in 8% in total patients across the study and new per uh, permanent posterior dysfunction or DI was seen in 2.8%. The uh, 
the overall way we put this together was that surgery is very effective and safe regardless of technique. And the collective data, including ours to date, does not strongly support one approach over another, despite the natural the national trend as previously shown to transition to these uh, endoscopic techniques. I, I did want to have a shout out to Dr. Atkinson. I think we've always tried to be a fair and, and, um, uh, and balanced institution and uh, continue to uh, jab each other over uh, you know, his approach, my approach. But in the end, I think what's important is that we're both very uh, interested in providing excellent care uh, for pituitary patients. And I think that's also important given our large group of additional staff that helped with this with Dr. Choby, Casper Bauer, Stoken, Dr. Janice O'Brien, Little, and uh, Drs. Bonkos, David Pitts, um, Herndon, and uh, Erickson, and Dr. Lanier in this particular study. We're really thankful for such a wonderful and large team that we have. So in the end, thank you very much for your time uh, and um, looking forward to answering questions. All right, thank you so much, <clears throat> Dr. Van Gumpel. Um, it was that was a really great presentation. We actually have zero questions, so I think you pretty much covered everything. So okay. nobody, yeah. Um, if anybody does come up with a question, you're more than welcome to reach out, and we can get those answered for you. And thank you again for such a valuable presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. And thank you everyone for your time. Have a good thank day. Thank you. You too. And this will conclude today's webinar presentation. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. If you missed any part of this webinar or if you'd like to share it with family members or friends, it will be available on our website at www.pituitary.org after it is edited. There will be a brief survey after the webinar. Please fill it out to help us provide you with the information you need. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again, Danielle. How do, how do I get out of here? <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and end it right now. Thank you so much. Okay.